right, this is track four in Palace Two. Denial of service is a service in asymmetrical warfare at its finest. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Mass. I'm a CEO of Swift Identity, and uh, we're a startup actually working on changing the world when it comes to security, authentication, and uh, identity management. So check out our website. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, denial of service as a service and an investigation we did. Uh, I've been in the security industry for over 20 years and I have two young uh, hackers in training right now at three and five years old. And um, you know, it, it was a really interesting experience. I thought it would be interesting sharing uh, what we did and how we actually finally caught a guy and got him arrested. So one uh, morning we got a call from a mid-sized uh, ISP. And uh, that ISP actually is a very big ISP in the region, uh, up in, uh, in Canada. And uh, on November 25th, 2012, they started getting some, some attacks. And it started actually about one a week, and that eventually escalated quickly. And what's interesting about that is that when you're an ISP out in these more regional areas, you do everything there. So uh, just to give you an idea, 911 went down. Don't ask me what 911 was doing on the internet. Uh, voice over IP, all the residential people started losing their service and even a chicken farm lost a couple of thousand chickens because the management system uh, was using the internet uh, to manage the chicken farm. So it actually had a, a pretty broad uh, impact. So basically the way it would work is during business hours we'd get these uh, uh, traffic, these large uh, attacks and it would ramp up pretty quickly. And the initial actual target of the, of, the, uh, of the attack was a customer of the ISP. They weren't attacking the ISP per se. And uh, what was also interesting is that ISP didn't use RFC 1918 addresses internally. They had publicly routable IP addresses even on their internal network. So when they started getting uh, attacked, it affected basically everyone. So everything would go down. And I remember these conference calls we'd have when the attacks started happening. And I, I'd be calling in over a normal phone. And the uh, employees of, uh, of the company would start dropping calls because their uh, voice for IP would go down as the, they were being attacked. So that was kind of uh, funny in a not so funny way. <laughs> um, so where do you start? So they called me and said, Rob, we need you to help us. We hear you know what you do when it comes to this. Uh, you know, I said, let's take a look at the logs. And, uh, you, know, we, you know, the logs of the attack itself, I mean, they're open DNS resolvers. The Cloudflare guy talked about it today. Um, so this is, you know, the IPs almost were absolutely meaningless. So I concentrated on, you know, an hour before the attack did we see anything specific, probing specific ports and there's nothing useful. And the only thing I really had to work, uh, work with is one potential suspect. So this guy used to be a network admin and he used to work for a company called Concepta. This is all public information. It's been in the news uh, in Canada. And uh, this guy actually left to start a company. And his company, oddly enough, specialized in DDoS protection. So, you know, using some open source intelligence, we took a look at LinkedIn, Facebook, who is, Googled a few things to see what we can find. So the first thing we found was uh, a small few, I apologize in advance, but in his uh, LinkedIn, you know, it says his technical background, where he worked and stuff, so get a bit of a background on him. And then, uh, so what we did was we started searching for Concepta on Google to see what would turn up and a lot of usernames were pop popping up on hacker forums. So the other thing that was interesting is in Canada in the section or the region I live, it's English and French. And when a French person writes in English, it's pretty evident. So when the guy would ask questions on these hack forums, the English was so bad, I was like, this guy has to be a French Canadian. And uh, also, the guy signed up in uh, November asking DDoS questions, which was the same day the attack started. So the other thing that was interesting is on his Facebook, he liked a, a DDoS uh, service called Demolition Stressor. So this guy was starting to look good. And, uh, you know, he's saying, hey, you know, I, I need to, uh, I, I want to attack a small website. I don't have uh, LOIC or... Uh, you know, it's not enough uh, in terms of what I have. I can pay for this without any problem. Please, if you have a nice uh, botnet, contact me, user Concepta. So, you know, that was kind of interesting. And then on another hack forum, people are saying, hey, we're giving out DDoS and booter services. And that guy's like, yeah, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a free account. Okay, that was good. And then, uh, you know, he's helping people on how to DDoS uh, uh, other websites. So a very friendly, helpful uh, guy. And um, 
eventually, you know, he, someone says, here's a booter, and he's like, thanks, give it to me, very appreciative. So we had a lot of good stuff going. And then on his Facebook page, as we mentioned before, he had a like at the bottom, which happened to be in November 2012, of a website called Demolition Stressor. And at that time, I didn't know what a stressor was. I mean, I knew about DDoS attacks and stuff, but I didn't know the st stressor was the operative word in, in, the, in the community. So I was like, oh, demolition stressor, that's kind of interesting. So what can we find? Well, based on the date and his Facebook page, there, whoops, there is at the bottom this link. And when you clicked on it, it would actually go to a website called Rage Booter. And uh, I believe Brian Krebs talked a bit about this whole community uh, in his blog, so there's really a lot of interesting things about uh, the stressor and booter community. And uh, so now we knew, well, Rage Booter, the guy likes Rage Booter, uh, maybe we have enough information. So we call local police, because that's how it starts, and we say, hey, you know, we think we're being attacked. So then, you know, the police officer takes the call, he's like, well, what do you mean you're attacked? Like someone hit you with a baseball bat? And I'm like, no, it's with a computer. And he goes, someone hit you with a computer. No, no. It's like, <laughs> I have to kind of, you know, explain it. Now, that being said, you know, it's a local uh, state uh, law enforcement guy, super nice guy, or provincial for us in Canada, super nice guy, sympathetic. He's like, look, I need more stuff. And he's like, can you give me logs? So I'm like, I can give you a terabytes of logs, but, you know, it's, there's not much that's going to help you. So we didn't have enough meat, and we were on our own. They wouldn't even go to a prosecutor. So we needed more information, and the only lead I had now was this guy and this website called Rage Booter. So then I started investigating the world as DDoS as a service. And from, as an as a entrepreneur and business guy, I found a really fascinating business model. You know, a lot of people have been victims. Uh, and how do you track this down? So what I did was I went to Rage Booter and I signed up. And I got a $200 lifetime membership, which was awesome. And uh, when I first got it, I need to test it, of course. So how do you test it? Well, you test it on your friends that run websites. And uh, I'd call them and say, hey, how's your bandwidth going? Oh, we're going to attack. Okay, so now I know it works. I go, how much bandwidth uh, are you getting? And, uh, you know, within about 10 minutes, I was getting about 5 gigabits per second of traffic with this $200 account. And the other thing from a business plan, what's a business, uh, you know, you have easy plans and pricing. You have a day trial at $250. You have the Rage Bronze Monthly at $5. This is not a lot of money for the capability that you have as an attacker. So I got the uh, bronze lifetime for, uh, no, actually it was a $200 one, it's not there. So the other thing also is there's an easy to use GUI. You can do layer four attacks, layer seven attacks, layer three attacks, anything you want is there. So anyone, everyone remember Mafia Boy? This is, you know, this is a fancier version that anyone can use and, uh, you know, anyone could be an attacker with that $50 uh, plan or a $200 plan. Very powerful stuff. So for me what was really interesting was it's really asymmetrical warfare. If you think of from a military perspective what you know, people do in Iraq with IEDs, take out an M1 Abrams tank, you know, you have very little resources being spent to take down these huge entities. So 99% of my customers, and I'm talking billion dollar businesses, could be affected by these, some of these attacks that are not already on these DDoS protection servers. And even Rage Booter itself was protected by Cloudflare. So I thought that was interesting too, because as soon as you go to Ra a Rage Booter, it says protected by Cloudflare. <laughs> so that's obviously no negative comment towards uh, Cloudflare, it's just an observation. And, um, you know, what happens when you get 10 gigs of traffic? Even if you have, you know, it doesn't defy the laws of physics. If you have a pipe being filled up, there's nothing you can do about it. So how do we think out of the box on this one? I was pretty much stuck. I knew Rage Booter was, was, I had a feeling Rage Booter was being used. I knew that uh, that person, you know, I had a good feeling, but it wasn't solid enough evidence for the police to get interested. And a sales guy of the company who's, you know, tired of calling all his customers, explaining why they're going down, said, bro, ask the guy for the logs on Rage Booter. He actually didn't say bro because he's French. He said, hey, mon ami. But, uh, you know, he's like, can you get the logs from this guy? I'm like, why would the guy from Rage Booter give me the logs? Like, you know, it doesn't make sense, but you know what? I have absolutely nothing to lose. Why not? So you go on the website. They have a great customer service plan. You click and add them onto your Skype contact. And basically what I did was they said, hey, can I buy the log of Rage Booter? And the guy goes, no, you can't do that. We don't have any logs or whatever. And I said, look, your system is being used to attack someone that's having very strong impacts on a community, okay? I don't care. I don't want to necessarily 
you know, I'm not going to call a cop saying or anything. I just need to have access because I need to stop it. That's like my main concern. I'm not a police officer. I'm just a consultant trying to get a job done. It's not going to go to court. I'm not going after you. You know, what can you do? So he goes, look, I can't give you the logs, but let me check to see if our service is being used to attack you. It's like, yeah, I'll take what I can get. Sounds good. So he goes, yeah, like there's an attack now and uh, our site's being used. And by accident, he copy pasted the log into the Skype chat. <laughs> so this was, I was like, so what happened was I'm typing and then I see IPs and names and stuff and then it says this message has been refused, like, removed in like seconds and the username that appeared in that chat log for a split second was Concepta. So I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, like how do I, you know, get this information? So on another screen, I'm like Googling a Skype chat. What do I do? Like, you know, is it saved somewhere? Is there a text? And uh, I basically wrote at the bottom, like in the, right below that yellow line, I said, dude, I saw the IPs. Just give them to me. He wouldn't give them to me. So now I'm like, I know I have enough. But I need the, the solid evidence to go to the police. So now what happens is I saw the destination username tag variables. Unfortunately, I don't have photographic memory. And I Google dump OSX memory. Maybe it's live in memory. And I found this software called OSX PMEM. Uh, I need to buy that guy a beer or a bottle of wine. And I ran it against my memory live and it dumped out everything like a four gig file. So I ran strings on the file and what did I find? I found all the information I needed. I saw Concepta 2, I saw the IP address, I saw the command that was used, the date and time it was used. So now I had the information I was really looking for. So now we have enough evidence. We know that the suspect is an ex-employee of Concepta who has already previously admitted to other employees where he used to work that he used to control botnets. We also know that he, suspected, uh, he started a company that specialized in DDoS protection. He also did a like on Facebook of Rage Booter, a demolition stressor. And from the logs we got on Rage Booter, we have, I think, what's good uh, enough to go see the police. The thing is, even then, there's, you know, there's still a bit hesitant. So we looked at taking another strategy, which is a civil strategy. And a lot of people don't know this. But in the civil world, you can actually get an equivalent of a search warrant called an Anton Pillar. So you go to the judge, you say, I want to be, and it's usually mostly used in uh, intellectual property cases when you're trying to go to a company to seize their information to see if they copied your, your IP. So we went to a judge, we said, look, this, we suspect this company that is doing anti-DDoS protection is actually behind DDoS attacks. And uh, we want to go there, seize the servers, do an analysis, and, uh, and see what's going on. So these are very tough, but amazingly the lawyer convinced the judge to get it. We grant the orders, search the house, and he said, you know what, go on a Sunday. So off we went. Minus 20 Celsius, minus 4 that morning. It was very cold. And it was about an hour and a half away, and there were about 15 people to show up at the guy's house. You have the police, you have the bailiffs, you have computer forensic experts, you have the lawyers. You have to have three lawyers. You have to have impartial lawyer. His lawyer eventually shows up and the lawyer of the customer, lots of lawyers, very expensive by the hour, and, uh, and I was there. So we show up, the guy lets us in, and there's something wrong. It really, really, I was like, there's something wrong here. The guy knew we were coming. So how did he know that we were coming? Because when I got in, I didn't see guys stressed out at all. He was just there, yeah, no problem, here's my server, here's all my passwords. His wife looked pissed, but she wasn't too stressed out. And uh, I was like, here, go, go for it. So I set the expectation around with the customer. This guy probably wiped everything, so I don't know if we're going to find anything. And he was smiling the whole way. We went through terabytes of data, spent the, date there, uh, the day there, copied everything, and then brought it back. Now, once we did that, we started getting word that the Crown Prosecutor was interested. That if we got the judge to approve the Anton Pillar, now maybe law enforcement and the prosecutor could take it more seriously. So the suspect actually tried to quash the Anton Pillar, saying that it wasn't allowed. The judge threw it out. And then we took the drives and we gave a copy to the prosecutor. So now we were doing our analysis and the, the provincial police was doing the analysis as well. So a few days later, perp walked. Guy was arrested. And uh, I don't think he saw it coming. 
I mean, this guy thought he deleted everything. He thought there was no way we could find it. He thought he could uh, hide behind logs and all sorts of uh, different things. And in the end, we were able to get enough uh, to arrest him. So what were the lessons learned? Like, what did really came out of this investigation? So when you wipe the drive, wipe the whole drive. Now, what this guy did was he used some software, I forget what it's called, but it does, when you wipe the drive, it wipes the free space, slack space, and it puts Zs across everything. But it wipes the empty part, or the slack space. So what happens is, it doesn't wipe your backups. So all the backups were there that had all the logs. So that was one thing. Don't create an account with your own name. That's usually not very good. <laughs> the police can only do so much. So it was good, I mean, I have good uh, relationship. I did uh, quite a bit of stuff with law enforcement. I had a good relationship with them. But you got to do the heavy lifting on some of these cases. They don't have necessarily the expertise or the time because they're chasing drug dealers and money launderers and stuff like that. So you got to do a bit of the heavy lifting yourself. Don't like websites used to commit a crime. <laughs> don't pay with PayPal. So the other thing that we found on his computer were logs of him paying with PayPal with his cell phone and everything to the website. So that website, Ragebooter took uh, uh, PayPal and some like e-gold or something like that. So, uh, you know, th there was a trace there as well. Everyone mistake, everyone makes mistakes, and you know what, think out of the box, because if we would have never thought out of the box, we would have never caught this guy. So thanks, uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I'm here for any questions.